evening. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. This is tape 398. It's July 20th and side one of the tape. Before I get too long in the tape, I want to make one quick correction on last week's tape. That was number 397, July 13th, 1979. Lee Harvey Oswald came home from the uh, Japanese and Philippine bases, the U-2 bases, in his Marine Service on December the 22nd, 1958. And he stayed at El Toro Base, the Marine Base in California, until he was discharged September the 11th, 1959. Now, in the tape last week, I mentioned that in March of 59, four months after he came home, the uh, school at Madison, Wisconsin, the U.S. Military Academy, had listed that his last uh, location, his last education, was at uh, this particular academy or affiliation with it and that was four months after he returned from the Pacific from the tour of duty I had the El Toro as his postal station while he was away and also it continued until he was discharged but so far as we know as of yet he wasn't flown home from Japan to Madison Wisconsin but he was uh, explained by the Warren report as having taken one or two weekends off to go down to Tijuana uh, while he was stationed El Toro, and they're very precise about who he saw or what he did, precise in an obscure way, the way the Warren Commission worked. But he had his Russian language and his records and his learning kits while he was in Japan and the Philippines, so I don't know if he was flown home and back here to Monterey at the language school, the Presidio School, or whether he went right into Madison, Wisconsin, or how he last attended that school. But on the books, he was in California. He wasn't at Japan, at, in Japan at the time that he was supposed to be at this academy. This was a very heavy week in terms of news, but I think it is every single week there is so much coming out that's of importance. Uh, this was the anniversary of the moon landing, and Bill Casing was on KGO for an hour again talking about his book and the moon hoax. For those of you that don't have my tape or don't have the book, I'm going to give you the address one more time because it would be interesting to correspond with Mr. Casing. He lives not too far from me, uh, just about 45 minutes away up in Soquel, it's in, near Santa Cruz. And you can write to him for information on why he thinks we never landed at the moon. Also, the House Select Committee on Assassinations came out with their report this week. David Bellin was on KGO for one hour giving his multiple lies in defense of the Warren Commission. that He's been defending them for 15 years. He was an attorney on the staff. And I will take one entire tape maybe and just refute what David Bellin was spouting out this week on radio stations out here and also analyze his article in the New York Times defending the Warren Commission again. But as the report came out, the FBI was urged by the chairman of the committee, Mr. Stokes, uh, Lewis Stokes to, for the FBI to continue investigating the assassination of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Uh, I'm sure that Mr. Stokes knows a lot that is top secret. He doesn't want to divulge it. He's asking the Justice Department and the FBI to do it. Of course, they're not interested, and it is still mandatory to find out not so much who killed John Kennedy, but how the layers of cover-up at this point are still going on and the murders are still going on. I'll be doing more of that later. I also want to comment about uh, General Anastasia Somoza leaving uh, Nicaragua, the West Point graduate. He was put into power by the CIA. He abdicated and ran to Florida to be with his anti-Castro Cuban community. There's comfort in these exiles clustering together, and goodness knows what they're planning in the future. And then, of course, Admiral Jim's, James Carter was given a hard time in his uh, cabinet all of them except the ones that should put in their resignations. Mr. Brzezinski is still in and Cyrus Vance and Mr. Turner of the CIA. And But the uh, cabinet has been asked to resign. You all know those stories. They weren't asked. They submitted their resignations. It was a shaky week. Uh, if you can't see the connections between the killing of John Kennedy and that phony government that went on in Nicaragua or the manipulations of Jimmy Carter's fate, Maybe you haven't listened to my tapes long enough, or the advantage of the tapes is that you can play them over and listen. One of the men, that John Kennedy, was killed by the Central Intelligence Agency of the Pentagon. The other, Somoza, was put in power by the Defense Department and the CIA. 
finally kicked out by the people. And the last, uh, Jimmy Carter, put in by the Bilderbergers, the trilateral, the CIA, and his Defense Department cohorts from Annapolis is now being pulled away, and uh, they're doing a job on him like they did on Salvador Allende. It seems that Jimmy Carter was a weak man put in for an interim till the Pentagon could grow a few more muscles. And now all the rugs are being pulled out of Jimmy Carter at one time. Barrage of criticism, suggestions, he, re he uh, resigned, and they're really pretty heavy on Jimmy Carter. Everyone they visit uh, it seems to have something tainted about them. There was an article just in the paper yesterday about the last home they visited to meet the ground, grass roots. And this is in Carnegie, Pennsylvania. That host, Mr. Bill Fisher, had been charged for arson and criminal mischief an alcoholic who was at the time intoxicated but who's undergoing treatment now and of course they went on to say the Secret Service generally uh, checks out every single person that they screen them in one form or another so the Carter spent an evening with the Fishers they were the invited guests uh, to get a tune of what's going on in the country and they were with a an alcoholic who's under treatment who's been charged for criminal uh, offenses before isn't it strange that Rosalind Carter is photographed with that multi-murderer from Chicago and with this crazy maniac Jim Jones and now spending an evening asking about the problems of the country for a man who had been charged with arson and for various other problems of freaking out and the president goes to him to find out the uh, nature of his opinion of what's going on in the country. Not the man doesn't have a valid opinion, but this is general generally one more incident of just bringing the Carters down and trying to embarrass them. I saw a marvelous opera this week, it's actually light opera, but it's total opera, all voice, an amazing play pertinent to today's problems, and very few musical shows are, I think, Pacific Overtures by Stephen Sondheim was the last heavy political show of this type I've seen. It's called Avita Perone, and in case it comes to your cities, be sure and see it. And if you uh, don't get a chance to see it, buy the album. It's out, and buy the libretto if you can. You can order them from Drama Bookstore in New York, I'm sure. Avita Perone is based on the life of Eve Perone, the second wife of uh, Juan Perone, the Argentine president. It's the story of a poor woman born 1919, the year that World War I was over, when Germany had decided it will illegally rearm, and at the time that Woodrow Wilson was being poisoned with a lingering death instead of a quick death when he went to France to uh, sign the Versailles Treaty. The parallels here are seem to be overwhelming, and that's why I want to bring this up to you for the many layers of what's going on now and the pure genius of this production. Of course, Argentina was a location of Germans from the end of World War I up through World War II and afterwards for Nazis and their headquarters of espionage close to Antarctica and through Brazil and Uruguay, Paraguay, and Chile. Uh, this Eva was a poor woman, illegitimate, no background to speak of. She falls in love with a singer at a cabaret, and he takes her to Buenos Aires, and then through a series of vignettes, they show how she has a series of men that she sleeps with going from the musician up to the generals, the colonels and the generals, a series of love affairs, and then she meets Peron, and she convinces him to run for president of Argentina. He's one of a group of uh, military men who want the post. They have a scene there of a large rocking chair, symbolic maybe of John Kennedy's rocking chair or the game of politics, where there's six huge rocking chairs on the stage with the military men sitting in them, and they remind me of uh, the teams we have now running for president of the United States, identical to Argentina at the time Perón got in. Uh, we have John Connolly, who was Secretary of the Navy and Treasury, close ties with the Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense Industry Security Command, uh, Howard Baker of the CIA, who hushed up the Nixon-Watergate connections and the CIA connections. According to the William Colby report, he had close control of Howard Baker, Jerry Ford, the best congressman the CIA ever had, then being put in as president to continue covering up the tracks. And, of course, Alex Haig. You see, you could take each of these men today 
and put them in those rocking chairs and say which one it, by musical chairs that they play on the stage one remains and we have Hague of the Defense Intelligence Agency the National Security Agency George Bush former director of the CIA and Jimmy Carter the graduate of Annapolis and Navy Intelligence and of course Ted Kennedy with his strong links to the Aristotle Onassis Combine and a counterintelligence a so-called left group that have been very far right with things like the Senate crime bill and the Justice Department and suppressing the murders of his brother concealing the crimes of the intelligence community so our candidates today are similar to those men that were sitting in the rocking chairs and she convinces him to run for president and he wins and the people love Avita because she comes from them she was poor like them and on the stage they had two chorus lines a group of 10 about 10 or 12 people in each group and one represented the ruling class the aristocracy the ones linked to the nobility in Europe they go to London for their clothes at Harrods and they're the rich people of Argentine and they symbolically could be the rich ruling monarchy of any country and then the military that dance like toy soldiers and they sing and dance and the ruling class and the military hate Eva Perón because she got her appeal by saying I'm one of you I'm one of the masses working her way up through the people but having come from the working class she betrays them she isn't satisfied with the adoration of the poor she what she really longs for is the acceptance of the rich and she has schemes to take the money from the poor and throw a few crumbs at them while she goes after the approval from the crown heads of states that she wanted as the wife of her own and she can't get because she was of a very low origin socially and because of her previous background there's a scene where she goes to get clothes at Christian Dior and she has diamonds and she displays herself and dresses like the rich and thinks that then she'll be accepted by the rich and she goes abroad for international approval and the play has a screen that comes down and you have news clips going on all the time of the actual Vita Perón and um, she goes to Europe she goes to Franco to Spain a fascist dictatorship she goes to visit the Pope who had such close links with the Nazis and Mussolini making deals to uh, be quiet about their fascism in exchange for property that the Vatican would get so she keeps saying to the people at home I come from you but she really goes to heads of states of the fascist regime she goes to Paris where she's entertained the British monarchy refuses to accept her and she comes home hurt she is not accepted by them but her husband Juan Perón sends her alone on what is called a rainbow tour he knows that the military doesn't want her and the rich don't want her and there's a scene of him while she's parading around Europe with two young girls sitting on his lap he adored uh, children prostitutes little girls in fact the woman that Evita kicks out when she moves into Juan's bed is lying in bed with her doll and she packs up the suitcase and sends her away and begins her career with Juan Perón and he physically disassociates himself with her exactly like John Mitchell the man who plays Juan Perón remember reminds me of John Mitchell the way he separated from Martha Mitchell at the height of Watergate when she broke the story right from the beginning about the dirty tricks uh, Juan Perón disassociates himself from a video because not only do the masses like her more than him but he knows that his political career was buttered on the rich and on the military and she comes home and she's sick and there's a scene of separate bedrooms now he already has made his distance from her and she comes in and says that she wants to be his vice president and he opens the door to her room and he says you are dying and they give her one last radio program to step down from politics and she dies at the age of 33 and it becomes obvious when you see this player is obvious to me that the poor in Argentine were never going to get a shake or break any more than they will in the United States through labor or opportunities in many of the industries that they're still excluded from and while they believed in her and wanted to believe in her uh, she had no more interest in them because her lifelong dream had been these other people she got attention just to be used by Juan Perón by the masses and when the rich and the military realized that the masses just might catch on and have a people's movement like in the Soviet Union they had to have her killed 
she went to Europe, and as I saw this play, it came to mind, uh, the tape that I did going back April 18th, 1977, that was tape 265, on the poisoning of Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, and minutes of meeting, should we give him the quick death or a slow lingering death? In the play, beginning and ending, and throughout the whole play, is a young man called Che. He's a dead ringer for Che Guevara. Che Guevara was born in Argentine. He was a young student there. Uh, on the day that Eve Perón died, he was actually 24 years old. Che Guevara went on to study in the Soviet Union and to work with Fidel Castro in Cuba, and then he also was killed in the CIA by, by the CIA in Bolivia. He represented the people, the poor, the revolution. He makes fun of the mockery of the grand funeral and so forth. Eva Perón was embalmed. The people wanted to preserve her uh, like Lenin. The body was hidden for 18 years. And, of course, the story of her uh, burial and disappearance and the reappearance of the corpse is another story as intriguing as the life of uh, Eva Perón. She was the mirror of the truth and the reminder of the hypocrisies of people. And I liked the play for many, many reasons. And one of them was that the tragedy of Vita per Eva Perón Vita, was similar to what I see in many people's lives and in the social structure around me. People that are poor or from the working class who are socially idealistic in college or right out of college lose that idealism when they work their way up the ladder. There's a song in there. She sings that she's on ring number nine. She says, but I haven't forgotten you at six and seven. Uh, people work their way up, negate their past, play it safe. And many people, social activists today, have little separate causes that they feel very gratified in doing. The uh, large group I saw at Davis feel that they're very involved as they recycle all their cans and food and glass and separate it and jog, that that's their social commitment. Other people feel very safe with joining Save the Whales or not clubbing seals in Canada or at the time of Vietnam stopping just the napalm in Vietnam. And some people are out at fighting radiation at uh, Three Mile Island or the Shell Clam Alliance but, or down here in uh, Paso Robles, the PG&E plant. But that's the end of their involvement. They take one little thing. They can't handle the big problem. They're afraid. They're afraid of losing, losing status, of losing friends if they go too far. So most people just keep their mouths shut and watch the game unfold. And there's a marvelous song in there called Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. That song isn't allowed in Argentina today. This play opened two years ago in London. This is a West Coast troupe that uh, just was in L.A. and San Francisco, then it's going to Broadway. This song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, is not allowed in Argentina, and if anyone is heard playing it, they're taken to prison, and that's the end of them. It, even by cassette or records today, the song is not allowed in Argentina. In her last hours, she flashes back on the images of her life and what went through her mind, and asks the question, would she be happier as an obscure person? I don't think the question is, should I remain poor and happy and live a long time or whether I should do something worth dying for uh, that I believe in? The point was that she didn't believe in anything except keep climbing that ladder once she got a taste of going up. And the higher she went up, as Che kept saying, the harder it was to fall. And he would talk to her as she undressed, looking in the mirror, and point out uh, the problem that she presented in wanting to please the poor, but wanting the approval of the rich. The comparison between Evita Perone and Jimmy and Rosalind Carter came to my mind because Carter was handpicked by the trilateral, as I say, the Bilderbergers, David Rockefeller and that gang. And the image was he came up from the people. And they got this folksy sort of a combination of a mini Will Rogers, the governor from Georgia who wasn't too good at that, uh, the peanut farmer, the quaint mother from the Peace Corps, the sister, the faith healer, a little bit for everything, the rock musicians, the Greg Allman band that he was with or helped him with his first campaign money. And you had the, uh, the priest type going, the Sunday school teacher from the segregated church. And then he goes into the White House. They go fishing before they go into the White House. Barbara Jordan, the black woman, gives this great speech at the 
Democratic convention, and people for a moment thought there was hope, and he was just the pawn of the military, and now they're tearing him apart. They used him like they used Martha Mitchell or Avita Perone to get the masses roused up and get a single cohesive group that they can manipulate en masse, but now Jimmy Carter has to vote every weapon system. He has to have a closed system of the CIA. His cabinet is falling apart. He's getting the Salvador Allende treatment with bus strikes, radio uh, commentaries day and night out here. I don't know what you're getting in New York attacking him. When his same staff worked for Ford or Haig or Nixon, we never heard about them, like Califano or Cyrus Vance and Brzezinski. But when they worked for Jimmy Carter, um, he's criticized for a lot of the decisions. Schlesinger could work for these other people and when... He brings on this energy crisis. Jimmy Carter is to blame. They're ripping him apart piece by piece until the country can be stopped with all kinds of disturbances and even suggestions on the radio that he resigned. He's neither fish nor fowl. He doesn't represent the people he said he would represent when he came in. And he doesn't really represent the ruling class. He falls apart having to go through those orders. He wants the acceptance of the David Rockefellers and the Defense Intelligence Agency and yet he wants the people to love him. And I think the tragedy of Jimmy Carter is like the tragedy of Evita Perón traveling country to country to get approval uh, in Japan, Austria, all over the world, making conferences, trying to meet and having people and all of them laughing at him while his right-hand man, Bert Lance, is indicted for criminal, criminal charges. And as I say, his wife visits these notorious criminals that are controlled by the intelligence community. Carter is falling apart. Of course, the tragedy of his falling apart is our tragedy. And that's what Che is saying in the play of Vita. He's saying it was Argentine's tragedy. When she dies, we die. You know, the hopes die off. And what comes down, her deceit to the laborers, to the poor, his deceit to us is our whole tragedy. And as they manipulate him, Jimmy Carter, and they manipulated the regime in Argentina, they were simply causing the kind of chaos that preceded Adolf Hitler as an excuse to bring in Haig or Connolly or Bush or any of the military dictatorships under Kissinger and Gannon Brzezinski get us on the verge of World War III. These tragic people are selected and handpicked as leaders and let everybody down and fool themselves and end up very pathetic comedy tragedy creatures if you can as i say get the record and get the libretto it's a marvelous play and the parallels of the poisoning of wilson and i believe the poisoning of abita getting her out of the way and the distance that the mates played while the other mate died uh there's a lot in there that i see and a lot of other things i've studied Last week, I did a section of the tape on a man named Robert Opal, who was murdered in San Francisco. And even though though we have these earth-shaking events taking place right in front of us, I want to go back to Robert Opal case because it's a microcosm of what's going on in the world, and it's terribly important to read and follow the murder of this particular man. Uh, He was murdered last July 19, 1979, Two people came into his home. They tied up two other people that were there in a back room, and they shot his head, blew his head off, and left. Um, He's one of these little heroes that we should take a moment, as I say, to pay our respects to and to analyze because of the bigger story behind what the Robert Opal story. I said that uh, I was outraged because the San Francisco Chronicle described the murder is being motivated, the headlines, as a $5 murder. And the San Jose Mercury said the awards, that means the Academy Awards streaker, killed in a holdup. And they described it as a holdup. This is the gentleman who, in 1974, ran across the straight stage nude at the Academy Awards. But Opal was a political man, and he had recently hung an effigy, a uh, Dan White, in front of the UN Plaza in San Francisco. He pretended to shoot a friend dressed in all white, and there was a mock execution of Dan White. But I want to do a little follow-up on the Opal case because of the alleged robbery. And this is the story. 
Robert Opal, according to San Francisco Examiner, another story about him, was an absolutely free man. This is the lead story of Robert Opal yearning to be a free man. When arrested at the L.A. City Council meeting for appearing nude, he appeared at the trial dressed as Uncle Sam. He carried out this mock execution of Dan White, and he handed out leaflets in San Francisco at the time of the sentencing of Dan White. One admirer said there was a reason behind all of his antics. He was described in some ways as a visionary, and one of the things that he thought was important was sexual repression be stopped because it was politically uh, expeditious to pick on people because of their sexual habits and come down on them identically to the way that Adolf Hitler did with homosexuals. He sent them to the concentration camps for extermination, all except his top, top SS guards and army himself. But the street homosexuals were slain along with Jews and other political activists. Opal was described by an editor in the Bay Area as seeing a lot of political in mundane things. That's a, one of my... Uh, problems, I think, is seeing political and mundane things, and also it's a saving grace to be able to see them. He ran uh, art galleries in the gay community and wanted to start art galleries around the country run by gays. There was a quotation, he didn't do anything that did not have some kind of political or social statement. He was conscientious. He went about doing things differently, and because he was conscientious, as I say, I want to follow up the Opal Killers. Now, three people were caught, two men and a woman, Maurice Keenan, Robert Kelly, and Linda Holt. Only two men entered the room when he was killed. They were found at the San Francisco airport. They had baggage and many belongings. They were on their way to Florida. They were going to take a 10-day vacation. These were three people who allegedly blew this man's head off for $5.00. And according to the San Francisco Examiner, they had suitcases of all kinds of things. They carried walkie-talkies. They could be in communication with each other when they were apart. And they went in uh, to buy, Miss Holt, the woman, went in to buy three plane tickets for Florida. Now, a 10-day vacation, suitcases with, in quotes, all kinds of things, and no narcotics. The, another motive was supposed to be narcotics deal. There were no narcotics among their possessions and none in Opal's apartment. Mr. Keenan was angry when he was arrested. He went uh, off to the jail with the other two and he made the remark to the inspector, what are all these freaks with the cameras? Now the next day there was supposed to be a, an arraignment and the man who allegedly shot off Opal's head, Robert Opal's head, uh, was not put with the other two people who were arrested, Robert Kelly and Linda Holt. He was put in a separate cell with people who were in there overnight for being drunk. And they took his handcuffs off. They put him in the cell. The cell door was open. He walked right out of court. When you're arrested, they take your money and your keys and put them in a paper bag, your belongings. He had his evidently money with him. The two men who were watching him or guarding him, uh, deputies, William Sinclair and Anthony Kovic, have been suspended, temporarily at least, probably promoted on the sly been suspended. He never showed up for his arraignment. He went to his father's home in San Bruno, which is about 30 miles south of San Francisco. And when the police notified that this man had disappeared, the police were ordered to stake that house. And how they knew so fast where his father lived, I don't know. But they knew the house where his father lived in San Bruno. I said this man could be working as a plainclothes agent for uh, Dan White and the police department. And they were getting even with him for mocking the Dan White sentence in San Francisco. He went to the home where he picked up clothes, and they said on the media he could have shaved off his long hair and his mustache. He picked up more money and weapons, and he's been gone ever since. The newspaper said he may have several dollars in his pocket. They didn't bother to say how he got transportation to San Bruno, how they knew where the father's house was, why it wasn't staked. So the first error was after the alleged killer was caught was to put him in a cell separate from the others, remove the handcuffs, let him walk out of the court, the cell door was open, go to his father's home in San Bruno, and he hasn't been seen since. And that is the story of the man who blew off the head of Robert Opal, a very political person in San Francisco.
and to follow that story on the other side of this tapes, we're going to do a little bit about more about the politics of San Francisco because, as I say, what happens in California, you can see coming down across the country. This is the nest of counterintelligence, and it is very active and busy. And this man was allowed to go free not only out of the San Francisco jail, but in San Bruno, and they were allowed to get to the airport, and he has escaped, and he's out loose, and for all we know, could be in any part of the world or flown out Mexico, South America, given a new identity. The man wiped out any dissent on the streets, the man who made the handbill. And that's important because how many people are going to duplicate that street scene? And they'll get the message that their head will be blown off, and they'll be afraid to do what Opal did. Two of tape 398, July 20th, 1979. I want to speak a little bit about Charles Bates in San Francisco in regards to the George Moscone and Harvey Milk murders and the Robert Opal murders and the counterintelligence activities that are going on in that city. They keep referring to the SLA, the zebra killings, the uh, Zodiac killings. Charles Bates, who was head of the FBI in San Francisco through all this counterintelligence, he moved out to California after the Watergate, announced this last week that he would run for the chief of police job of Charles Gaines. Charles Bates has been sitting with a corporation. I'm sure it's a large fund for all kinds of terrorism and counterintelligence. It's Burns International Security Services and advises corporations on plant security and protection of their top executives. That's like DISC, Defense Industry Security Command, to protect the people making ammunition and weapons and space contracts, the clearances for them to work on these projects. There's also an International Security Services, and when Charles Bates left the FBI, in San Francisco, he stayed on the West Coast in Oakland and San Francisco to head this organization of this international security services as uh, part of the security on plants and employment of executives in these fascist countries whose lives are always in danger because of the people kidnapping them or killing them or overthrowing the government. The street scenes and the riots come very clear, and I knew there was something suspicious about those riots at the time of the sentencing of Dan White. Uh, at that time, the counterintelligence had to be working in the gay community. Mom O'Shea from KPFA, who's been an activist in the political scene in the northern area, told me about her being knocked down and injured by people rioting at, down at Castro Street, and they weren't from the area, and they weren't gays, and when she recorded interviews, they smashed her tape cassette and took the tapes out. Um, the police cars that were lined in front of the city hall the night of the riots were just like toy soldiers, one, two, three, four, five, just lined in a row. And the cameras very nicely photographed each police car catching fire. Well, the police are not that kind of the gay community in San Francisco that they would let all these windows be broken as violence proceed. They would have gone on and smashed their heads like they did the anti-war movement. But one by one, these cars were shown just in flames like little toy cars, and Gaines was accused of being too weak. But what happened was that the gay community became charged for being violent and uh, destructive, and the intent was to let this thing come down. New people came into the area with new boots and new sticks, and they were knocking people down, and the violence and the burning was taking place uh, there have been no charges yet about people who burned the cars. There was going to be a complete investigation. That's been totally hushed up. And at the time, I thought that Chief of Police Gaines would 
I get a slap on the hand for the delay because the delay is what was supposed to take place. Now, Gaines has been uh, told to resign or be fired by the first of the year by Mayor Diane Feinstein, but he's already been suggested uh, as maybe running for the mayor. That was in the paper yesterday. And he, there's political appointments everywhere available to Gaines. But Charlie Bates is an important person. Uh, if you don't have my article, the SLA is the CIA, you can get them from research in Aptos. I don't have any more copies. And as much about Charles Bates and the counterintelligence activities that he's been doing. And in January 23rd, 1972, on those White House tapes at the height of Watergate, Richard Nixon gave an order to limit the FBI investigation into the break-in, and he said he wanted no more concern than a small-town mayor might show for a parking ticket fixed for a friend. Nixon said, don't lie to them to the extent that there's no involvement. Just say it's a comedy of errors and that we wish for the country that it doesn't go, that we don't go any further in the case. In James McCord's book, A Piece of Tape, he also tells how John Dean met in Patrick Gray's office. Gray was the appointing, he was the acting head of the FBI, appointed May 3rd, 72, just weeks before the Watergate arrest, six weeks before. And John Dean had gone to Patrick Gray uh, to suppress the story of the Watergate arrest. And then, as I say, McCord's book, he says that Dean first met in Gray's office regarding the FBI Watergate investigation, and Gray informed him that Charles Bates of the FBI was handling the investigation. See, Charles Bates was setting up the counterintelligence, known as the SLA later, but he was handling the investigation of Watergate and then when that was safely put into other hands, he moved out to the West Coast, where by 1974, the full counterintelligence against the American Indian Movement, the United Prisoners Union, the United Farm Workers Movement, the lesbians on the West Coast, the anti-war demonstrators, the Bensaremos, the Chicanos, they were all being infiltrated and the leaders were being killed, such as Popeye Jackson from the United Prisoners Union and agents. Terry Jane Moore worked for the FBI and was an agent working in Randolph Hearst's office. This can of worms goes right back to the office of Charles Bates. And in my SLA article uh, that was published in 1974, the SLA is the CIA, I describe the similarities to the burning of the people at the SLA in Los Angeles to the killing in Chicago of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. Now, Charles Bates was in the FBI in Chicago in 1969 at the FBI offices. He moved in 71 to the General Investigative Division of the FBI in Washington, D.C., and then came out to head the FBI in California. But the parallels between the killing of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were so clear, just as the parallels between the burning of the SLA with the CBS cameras, the dinner cameras watching it, and the cameras watching the gay demonstrations in San Francisco orchestrated by counterintelligence. In each of these cases, like the Hampton-Clark case, before they were murdered, they were drugged by a man who worked for the FBI, and Donald DeFries and Christine Johnson and people inside of the house in Los Angeles were also drugged before the burning began. Uh, the police involved in Chicago with Fred Hampton and Mark Clark and the police involved in Los Angeles with the burning and shooting we're both told that in each case these people had killed a policeman earlier and there was this vengeance that worked them up and later they were found out they had been deliberately misinformed. Uh, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark had not killed Chicago policemen and Donald DeFries in the SLA had not killed policemen in Los Angeles. The article, the SLA is the CIA, goes into the Nazi Minutemen FBI connections of California intelligence I think it's a very important article for those of you that haven't read that. That was my third published article in The Realist. And Charles Bates, the man who was to work with Patrick Gray and the FBI cover-up of the Watergate story until it really began to unfold, uh, now is being suggested to run for chief of police in San Francisco, which is outrageous. Of course, the man behind Diane Feinstein, who's right in the middle working with these people, is a man named Richard Bloom. There's a long article about him in the San Francisco Chronicle this last year called Diane's Right Hand Man. Uh, he works for the U.S.R. U.R.S. Corporation, are the initials. 
He acquired the Evelyn Wooding Reading Dynamics for $7 million, and he sells advanced training to Fortune Magazine's top 100 companies on international business, architecture, planning, and design. And he works for the company for the acquisition of uh, new companies, collecting together and putting them into one piece of a pie. He merges companies. This Bloom is director of a mutual fund, a real estate company in Australia, and served until just this last December every month advising the White House on how to revitalize the nation's cities. Well, you see what's happening in San Francisco, the way that city is being revitalized. Uh, if the former FBI man runs for the chief of police and the chief of police wants to be the mayor, uh, we're really in trouble, and I know we are anyway, but the Opal case and the way he was murdered, and I said last week it was plain clothesman or somebody used by the police establishment, and that getaway and the manipulation of Feinstein through this Richard Bloom. Uh, she met him last April of 78. He had been divorced, and she was a widow, and he took her right away to the Himalayan mountains uh, with some good friends, and he's been kind of the control, and the Washington, D.C. links to that place called the City Hall in San Francisco. Uh, Bloom is a connecting agent of the politics of the Eastern Establishment to the San Francisco pol Political Center. And if there was a center of Jonestown being a Defense Department experiment and a CIA experiment, and Moscone and Milk were killed because of the links of the police department and the San Francisco officials such as Tim Stone and Don Freitas and D.A. Hunter covering up the, all the links of the San Francisco politics to Jim Jones, the Washington Connections, is as Richard Blum. So now if she tells Gaines to resign, what she's really doing is making way for Charles Bates. By taking the resignation of Gaines at this time, there is this terrible specter of Bates taking over. And the question is, is she getting her orders from Richard Bloom with his contacts to the D.C. establishment to Mondell, uh, he's very close to Mondell and the trilateralist international ties. So from Washington every week or monthly to Richard Bloom to Diane, now Charlie Bates, the Washington, D.C. FBI man who was first trained in London, was in Chicago during these murders, responsible for the SLA murders and the kidnapping and the San Francisco racism and violence. You have a network here. I hope it isn't too complicated for you. But it's important to discuss it with you because I think a lot of this is going to shape uh, connecting the east to the west and California to Washington to the whole central intelligence network that's been working for a long, long time out here. A very fine man died this week, and he was in the process of writing two books. His name is Joseph Borkin. He was 67 years old, and he died in Chevy Chase, Washington, right outside of Washington in Maryland, from a heart attack, Joseph Borkin. He was writing two books, controversial books, on antitrust cases and one book called The Lawyers of Watergate. I would just love to see the book that he was writing on Watergate. I hope it doesn't get relegated to the boneyard like the Martha Mitchell book she was writing, the George de Morinchild book that he was writing, the Gary Powers book that he was writing. Joseph Borkin, he was 67 years old. He worked in Washington, D.C. with the Senate Special Committee that investigated munitions industry and the Federal Communications Commission. He joined the Justice Department as early as 1938. He was their chief economist in the Antitrust Division. He's the author of the book, The Crime and Punishment of I.G. Farben. That was published last year in 1978. He linked I.G. Farben uh, with Germany's war materials, the holding off of supplies of strategic war materials, how it was possible for Germany to survive during the war, and how they developed synthetic fuels, rubber, and so forth, and pharmaceutical products, and early work in plastics. The I.G. Farben, according to Borkin and others, purged all Jewish scientists from their work and they used slave labor during the entire World War II. Of course, it was that Olve uh, chemical company that Pope John Paul II worked for, and that was a subsidiary of J.G. Farben at Auschwitz.
called Oshwin, sold a chemical fu- company. Mr. Borgen, according to the Washington Post, studied German political and economic history. He studied the Farben ties to the United States corporations. And then he studied the agreements by which IG Farben worked in Great Britain and in Fan- France. You see, those Farben chemicals could be very influential on persons such as Woodrow Wilson or Vita Perón to get rid of it and many, many others. They were very much into chemicals for all. We can't forget the Jack Ruby cancer, the Martha Mitchell, the rare cancer. Uh, goodness knows what these various companies could come up with and how they've used medicine to eliminate people that were in their way. The farming companies, according to Mr. Bork, and of course this has been uh, written up from other sources also, was instrumental in working along with our allies, Britain and France, to bring about wartime shortages. Aluminum, nickel, tungsten, carbide, magnesium, and so forth. Uh, we were cutting ourselves off in order to make sure that Germany won the war because we really wanted them to win the war against Russia. But Russia held out at Stalingrad and the tables were turned and moved, they moved west. Then we had to realign ourselves with Germany and Japan as soon as the war was over. Mr. Borgen wrote a book in 1962 called The Corrupt Judge, which is about bribery and conflict of interest in the federal bench. But the important thing, one of the very important things is, as I say, the two books that he was writing at the time of his death, death, one on the antitrust cases and the other, the lawyers of Watergate, because the story of Watergate, I'm sure, would go back again to Charles Bates and the very persons that are working themselves up into the political mainstream across the country and are very influential in things that are happening today in terms of counterintelligence. Watergate was very little, actually, compared to what's happening today. So Joseph Borkin has died, and it'll be of interest to see if posthumously those books ever do get out, or it'd be wonderful to know what was in them, but I'm sure we'll never know. Interesting timing that Joseph Borkin dies July the 6th, 1979, at the time that he's writing about these lawyers of Watergate, and Charles Bates, the FBI man who had a major part in covering up the very first stories of Watergate in the Justice Department and the involvement of the people announces just a week later, July 14th, 79, that he'd like to be chief of police in San Francisco. There was a story in the Associated Press uh, out of Springfield, Missouri, that it was in, actually in the San Francisco Chronicle out here on the drama page, lost in the back page, about page 42 or something, um, <clears throat> July the 12th, 1979, that was eight days ago, as I say, Associated Press story, but in all the newspapers that I have so far around the country, I haven't seen this story. If any of you have the article, um, send me any copies you have on it. But this is terribly important. It's about a man in Springfield, Missouri, who was arrested. He was picked up and charged with murdering a lawyer by the name of Joseph Langworthy. And when he was arrested in Springfield, Missouri, uh, he claimed that, uh, I guess as part of his defense, he was going to tell about other murders he did. So he spilled out that he had uh, killed a man in Detroit late July 1975 and that he was paid $30,000 to do that job and that he believed it could be uh, Jimmy Hoffa, the president, former president of the Teamsters Union. Hoffa disappeared on July 30th of that year, and he claims in July of 75 that he was paid $30,000 to kill a man in Detroit. But that isn't all he did. He claimed that he sabotaged an airplane plane crash in 1976 near Chillicothe, Missouri, that killed six persons. And on the plane was U.S. Representative Jerry Litton, a Democrat from Missouri. Now, I've talked on the tapes many times about the San Diego plane crash that was supposed to have Lieutenant Merv Dimely, Lieutenant Governor Merv Dimely from California, running against Mike Kerb, that fatal plane crash that he took the Sunday evening plane and wasn't killed on Monday, and the Obershon plane crash. There's been many, many crashes. This is the one where John Warner 
got the Senate seat, a staunch conservative in the Senate, uh, over because of a small lightweight plane crash. There was one that Ted Kennedy missed just several weeks ago off of Cape Cod at Hyannisport. This man claims that he assisted to sabotage the killing of a U.S. representative, Jerry Litton. There hasn't been a headline in any other paper or an article, and this is this shocking because I've mentioned before also this man that worked for the CIA who told me about the 10 murders that he did for the CIA and that he stopped when he was supposed to kill Congressman Schroeder, the woman from Colorado. She's still alive, and he had blown that story and claimed that um, he was supposed to do that, and that's when he drew the line. But there hasn't been a thing about investigating the death of Representative Jerry Litton in, De in Missouri. It'd be interesting if any of you have the time. I really don't have because I'm working on a book, but I would just love it if some of you could go back to that time period uh, before this last year and get the voting record of Representative Jerry Litton or write to his family in Missouri. The uh, congressional uh, directories would have his address of the former representative and ask the family if they ever investigated the sabotage and to get into those lawsuits because if the conservatives can't get elected until we get a Congress identical to the Congress that elected uh, Adolf Hitler in 1933, if they can't get elected, they, the uh, opponents are being murdered along the way. I have said this for a long time that we have these death squads and the silence of this news from the other media is simply resounding. It, it's so obvious that this story should be investigated and yet there's, there's one press release, that's it, and silence. If you find any more about it, let me know because I think it's important. I received an article from one of the listeners of our tape subscriptions called Tyrants Beware Copier and Cassette. Remember back at the time that the Shah of Iran was out and we were discussing the revolution of uh, Mr. Khomeini and the way the tape cassettes were used to inform thousands of people uh, in Iran about Savak and what the Shah of Iran was doing. And we talked about the importance of the revolution of the tape cassettes that were sent uh, into Iran and were kept in bookcases and sold at the marketplace. Of course, anybody who was seen with them was tortured, I'm sure, by the Savak and removed. But people took a good chance to get this information out, and the chance worked. Uh, an article by Anthony Sampson that was sent to me, it's from London, he wrote The Sovereign State of the ITT and several other excellent books. This is from the Minneapolis Tribune, and it's about the influence of politics asking, is modern technology beginning to turn against tyranny? And it's very much like the other uh, uh, tape I did on the tape cassette machine, but it talks about the Xerox copier, that the tape and the Xerox copier, the cassette and the copier, have been underestimated as a political power. And I'm sure that while I'm one of the first people in the country to start this type of newsletter, that it should catch on more and more. And I hope that some of you, I know a lot of you don't, but I hope that some of you are making cheaper copies of these cassettes that you can duplicate and get them off to your friends and families and members of Congress and so forth. And I know from the mail I'm getting that they're going to many, many places and being copied a large numbers of them, but not enough yet to make a political dent. Uh, we have to get more of these copies out, I think, to really make an influence on the milieu around the country. But this article goes into the fact that when a secretary runs off a paper for a system where there's an internal security, that one extra sheet can be used for blackmail, and the cassettes are revolutionary instruments in world politics. And the article concludes, perhaps, perhaps the cassette and the copier will be as significant as the audiovisual age of Gutenberg's invention of book printing. That radio and TV are important, but the Xerox machine, uh, just as I write my bibliography for you each week, I take it to instant copy, and they make copies. I have one copier at home, but they're not quite as good or clear for you. And these sheets can go all over the world and be put in envelopes and mail and information disseminated 
which is a great way of saving time and it's a great way of getting information out, book lists and sources of information. And I think more and more people are getting aware of the use mm -hmm. of the cassette and the copying machine and it is a political tool. If you use it right, if you use your voice and call up radio talk shows and if you use this machinery right, it should be making itself felt in a short time in many, many ways before the cost of these things goes up and the lid is put on them that makes it not so easily to get the, easy to get the information out. You have to use it while it's available on the assumption that it could be cut off from you from the same time if it's too good a thing. Just as in Argentine, you can't hear the song, uh, Don't Cry For Me, Argentine. There can be orders of no tape cassettes or no cassette machines. That happened when the people went down to Jonestown. They took $5,000 and uh, their tape recorders and cassette machines for music or messages or to send letters home. And the first thing Jim Jones did when they got into Georgetown in Guyana was to take away the tape cassette. It couldn't be used to send messages home. The messages home had to be dictated and screened and the messages that came back were controlled. And he knew the power of the tape cassette to get a message home like, hey, I'm starving, send for me, or call Congress, or get the American Embassy here. That wasn't allowed. The tape cassette is a political instrument. It's a very important instrument, like the typewriter and the printing press, and you should respect it and use it and duplicate these tapes and send them to public officials. And I couldn't guarantee we'd get any action, but it'd be interesting to know if they ever really were flooded with information and the country could be flooded with information made available through these printed sheets reading, reaching more people and the tapes reaching more people. I've been getting mail asking about any follow-up of Bob Trevor on KGO and Jogwell Bank and uh, any more about Alternative 3. There isn't a word. Uh, nobody from Great Britain in the establishment where Sir William Ballantyne was alleged to work will come forward and uh, get on the air and deny that they know who he is and yet they won't get on the air or have any articles or interviews saying that Alternative 3 is hogwash and that it's pure fiction. I have many, many articles every week on the uh, bad air, the overpopulation, the allegations that are in Alternative 3 are in the news. Every week a listener from New Jersey sent me an article New Generation of Astronauts is Ready. This is from Gloucester County Times, Sunday, July the 8th, 1979. And it's from the Space Center in Houston, Texas. And it's about the challenge of the new piloting the new spaceship and that new astronauts are ready to go up and operate uh, the way you see how humans operate beyond their home planet. This article says the shuttle, space shuttle, is the size of a DC-9 jetliner. It will carry up to seven persons and 65,000 pounds of cargo. After its mission, it will land on a runway of its initial launching bases in Cape Canaveral, Florida. It will be refurbished and it will go back again in two weeks and every shuttle will make at least 100 trips. By 1983, a second shuttle base will be at Vandenberg Air Force in California mainly for military missions conducted by the Defense Department. At first, the shuttle will do things now assigned to expendable rockets, put satellites in order, orbit for communications, weather forecasting, Earth research sources survey, scientific research, and military reconnaissance. And then they'll fix these satellites in space and send back information. NASA has sold out the first 32 operational flights through the first half of 1983. You know, I talked about that on the tape about China making their reservations. And the users will be from the Defense Department, the ITT, the International Telephone Communications Satellite Consortium, the European Space Agency, private industry, and foreign countries. More than 100 major oil, gas, and engineering firms, for example, formed a committee to work with NASA to develop space sensors to search for the Earth's natural resources, pharmaceutical and high technological firms hope to take advantage of weightless orbiting to simplify the manufacture of their items of exotic enzymes and pure vaccines and single crystal semiconductors, space factories and space colonies to support them 
could evolve from this research and open up the next industrial revolution. A man from Houston, Texas, says the shuttle will lead to the solution of the Earth's growing energy shortage. They will assemble a huge structure that could capture the sun's rays and beam them to the Earth for conversion to energy. Whatever we have, whether it is a permanent station, a moon base, a solar power satellite, it's the shuttle that will get us back and forth. The idea of finding how man can live and what adaptations he will have to make in terms of long-term space colony or moon colony fascinate me, one person said in the article. The machinery of space is great, but the human aspect interests me more. And, of course, this gets back to what I said all along for many, many years. That a handful of corporations have used American tax dollars to build space station satellites so that they can see where the agriculture is, where the famines are, where the water is, where the minerals, and many, many minerals are, the reserves, or even gold in the ocean. And the taxpayers make the stations, but we don't get a percentage of what they see there. They can spot the land, kick people off their land, grab the land, overthrow countries, and continue this huge imperialistic, monopolistic grab by having the advantage of the machinery up there to tell them what is going down in the earth so that everything we have is subject to their acquiring it, to overtaxing us, to making us lose our property. If they want specific things that are under our land and the globe is simply a place to be photographed and x-rayed so that they can go in and take the grabs just as Adolf Hitler killed the bodies and pulled the gold out of the teeth. This is the rate of planet Earth paid for by the taxpayers to build the cameras and the satellites so that they can come down and take all the minerals and all the resources necessary for their profits and make these huge microwave weapons and tell us it's for a great advancement. It's the Western movement that killed off the Indians and the animal, the wildlife. It's similar to that. This is the rape of planet Earth by NASA and the space agencies with no noticeable benefit that will come to hardly a single person. Well, they fly up there and photograph and take a view of us, an x-ray view of what's here on the Earth for their own financial purposes, and we pay for the machinery. Our time is up now. I'll be with you next week. You take care and have a good week. This is Mae Brussels in Carmel, California. Thank mm-hmm. you.